Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Midwest Prairie Summer Service Co-op for 2021. As our congregations begin planning to reopen in-person gatherings this fall after our long pandemic separation, we take this opportunity for a series of virtual visits with some of our neighboring UU churches over the summer weeks. Each Sunday, you are invited to experience inspirational messages from a variety of our ministers, together with music and other elements that make our communities special. We hope that this morning's service will engage your thoughts and lift your spirits, giving you courage to make a difference in the world and helping to strengthen the connections that sustain us all. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Jill Jarvis speaking to you from Kansas City, Missouri. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to this eighth service in our Summer of Cooperative Virtual Worship. I'm joined today by my colleague, the Reverend Diane Miller in Salina, Kansas. We're both retired Unitarian Universalist ministers and honored to be part of this collaborative effort to bring a diverse, meaningful worship experience to our participating congregations and guests. Speaking of guests, we welcome all of our virtual visitors today. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever the face of your heritage. We hope here you might find comfort, connection, and maybe even a little challenge. To all of you, we're glad you're here. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. Oh, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. We are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's dreamings, and we are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We Mothers of courage, fathers of time, daughters of dust, and the sons of great visions, we're sisters of mercy, brothers of love, lovers of life, and the builders of nations, we're seekers of truth, keepers of faith, makers of peace, and the wisdom of ages, we are our grandmother's prayers we are our grandfather's dreamings and we are the breath of our ancestors we are the spirit of god we are mothers of courage fathers of time daughters of dust and the sons of great visions we're sisters of mercy brothers of love lovers of life and the builders of nations we're seekers of truth and keepers of faith we are makers of peace and the wisdom of ages we are our grandmother's prayers we we are our grandfather's dreamings, and we are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. We are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's 
mother's dreamings We are the breath of our ancestors We are the spirit of God For each child that's born A morning star rises and sings to the universe Who we are For each child that's born A morning star rises and sings to the universe Who Life comes for us in a thousand different ways, undoes plans and upends traditions, knocks down the doors of our defense. In a moment, every expectation releases like the in and out of breath. For this hour, we gather to surrender to the mystery, to release ourselves from the needing to know, the yearning to have it all already figured out, and also the burden of believing we either have all the control or none. Here in our songs and our stories, we make space for a new breath, a new healing, a new possibility to take root. That is courage forged in the fire of our coming together and felt in the spirit that comes alive in this act of faith, that we believe still a new world is possible, that we are creating it already, here and now. Come, let us worship together. Chalice lighting. If you have a personal chalice at home or a family chalice that you like to light for our Zoom services, I invite you to light it along with mine today. Today I light a chalice for the first time with my left hand. 
it's a bit awkward because I'm not a lefty, I'm a righty. But like it or not, my right hand is in a sling and immobilized, so I'm using the one that's available, my left, also broken, but available. So many things during the pandemic are awkward and unfamiliar. We are forced to learn new ways of doing things. So much is broken and in need of mending and healing. So much is in need of patience and rebuilding. So much we need to recreate in new ways of being together as congregations. May the kindling of this chalice light the ways forward that we will discover. The Great Realization is a poem about a dad telling a bedtime story to his son. First, the dad describes the world that was before the COVID pandemic, a world that to most people seems normal. Then the virus arrives. Some people, maybe some of us, are living through the pandemic, just like the dad describes. For others, though, maybe for some of us, it's different and much harder. But then, well, let's listen to this tale of a future better world that someday could be real, especially if we work to build it together. Tell me the one about the virus again, then I'll go to bed. But my boy, you're growing weary, sleepy thoughts about your head. Please, that one's my favorite, I promise, just once more. Take me back to 2020. That's all I'm asking for. Okay, snuggle down, my boy. Though I know you know full well. The story starts before then, in a world I once would dwell. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's 2020. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we ever could have planned. We'd always had our wants, but now it got so quick, you could have anything you dreamed of in a day and with a click. We noticed families had stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke. But the meaning must have melted and the work-life balance broke. And the children's eyes grew squarer and every toddler had a phone. They filtered out the imperfections, but amidst the noise, they felt alone. Every day, the skies grew thicker till you couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them, while down below, we filled our cars. We'd drive around all day in circles. We'd forgotten how to run. We swapped the grass for tarmac, shrunk the parks till there were none. We filled the sea with plastic because our waste was never capped. Until each day when you went fishing, you'd pull them out already wrapped. And while we drank and smoked and gambled, our leaders taught us why it's best to not upset the lobbies, more convenient to die. But then in 2020, a new virus came our way. The governments reacted, told us all to hide away. But while we all were hidden, amidst the fear and all the while, we dusted off our instincts. We remembered how to smile. 
we started clapping to say thank you and calling up our moms. And while the car keys gathered dust, we'd look forward to our runs. And with the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe. And the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the seas. Some people started dancing, some were singing, some were baking. We'd grown so used to bad news, but there was good news in the making. Old habits became extinct, and they made way for the new. And every simple act of kindness was now given its due. And so when we found the cure and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found to the one we'd left behind. But why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Well, sometimes you get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. So lie down now and dream of tomorrow and all the things that we can do. And who knows, if you dream hard enough, maybe some of them will come true. We now call it the Great Realization. And yes, since then, there have been many. But that's the story of how it started. And why hindsight's 2020. It's the offering time. Generosity is good. Generosity is a virtue. It is an essential element of a living faith. Giving is a spiritual discipline. The methods of giving vary from congregation to congregation. This is how we sustain our faith our witness in our communities, our presence in this world. This is a time to give, to cultivate a generous spirit. Offer your support. Make a gift. Provide your pledge. Be of generous heart. Feel good about it. Be thankful for the ways you can give. At the Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we have a big vision. We aspire to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. Each week on Sunday, we take up a collection to support the work of our church. If you'd like to consider a contribution today, you can click the donate button in the footer of the website, www.unitarianlincoln.org, or you can give via text giving, simply text UC Lincoln and the amount to 73256. We are building a new way. We are building a new way. We are building a new way, feeling stronger every day. We are building a new way. We can feed our every need. Every need. We can feed. We can feed our every need. Every need. Peace and freedom is our cry. 
about a month ago, I received an email from a French friend of mine. She'd attached an article from the latest issue of a popular magazine. It described surprising changes to a deeply ingrained and cherished French custom dating back to Roman times, a custom known as la bise. That's the common peck on both cheeks or into the adjoining air exchanged in greeting, an automatic and almost obligatory gesture between family, friends, sometimes friends of friends and work colleagues, or in any social situation where everyone is greeting people that way. Of course, many foreigners in France are annoyed by the ubiquity of the bees, la bees. I have often wondered about the issue of consent. But this century old tradition may be changing because of COVID, not just temporarily suspended, but truly changing. A rough translation of the article in question tells us this. Whenever she sees her close friends, Ode doesn't think twice about it. She delivers two pecks on their cheeks. The question, she says, is whether to do lobbies with someone when you don't feel like it. It's great now because we're able to hide behind the COVID guidelines, being able to choose. Others like Frank see it as a means for people to reconnect with their friends and family after a long period of distancing. He says, once vaccinated, you're a little less careful about the safety measures. You give yourself permission, but now only with people close to you. Pauline works as a marketing director. Among her colleagues, they've adopted new habits. See, elbow bump, the way from a distance, we don't worry about lobbies anymore. I don't think that's gonna change. What strikes me most about this development is not only how easily people can adapt when they're forced to fundamentally change a thoroughly ingrained tradition, but also that at least some French people, notably younger people, were already uncomfortable with that tradition, but didn't imagine it could change, let alone that they themselves might start to change it. Maybe you can see an analogy to what our congregations have experienced in the last year and a half. Forced into new realities we never could have imagined in our wildest dreams. Finding the capabilities individually and collaboratively to accomplish things we frankly wouldn't have imagined because some of those new ways of being we wouldn't have even wanted. All virtual worship, annual meetings, general assembly, Zoom choirs, drive-by flower communion. And here we are. I would like to say, I was planning to say, here we are getting ready to emerge into a new normal, looking forward to the comfort and familiarity of returning to ways of doing church that we've longed for. And what will that look like? But I can't say that as it turns out. In fact, most of us right now don't really know what we can say about in the words of our overarching theme, Chosen Last May, opening up. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling like Charlie Brown in the Peanuts cartoon with normalcy being the football and the universe being Lucy, having finally convinced me yet again to believe that the end of the pandemic is in sight. Then as I move forward to embrace that reality, snatching it away at the last minute. But like Charlie Brown, I'm willing to trust again in faith that the universe is ultimately more accommodating than Lucy. I truly believe that one of these days we will be safely together again in physical space, that it will probably look different than what we remembered and were hoping to recreate. But I don't think, I don't know what that new way of doing church will look like, living into our missions and answering our calls. 
None of us knows that. I suspect that when we finally do get to the point where it feels safe to physically gather in community, whether next month or next year, we're going to viscerally rejoice in being able to look into each other's actual eyes, not an image on a screen. Someday being able to join our voices in song and move our bodies as we're able in creating meaningful rituals, just settling into the comfort and security of beloved religious home. That is as it should be. We're called as Unitarian Universalists to provide comfort in times of grief, loss, chaos. Church is also a place, physical, virtual, or otherwise, that offers the possibility of transformation for ourselves, for our congregations, for the larger community, and for the world. But let's name the fact that sometimes it feels very hard to attend to both those purposes of beloved community because they sometimes feel almost mutually exclusive. Transformation requires something hard of us to be open to vulnerability, struggle, loss of the familiar and cherished. All things we've had more than enough of by now, thank you very much. All things that lead us to crave comfort and security. Yet in the midst of chaos, we have the opportunity to move beyond our comfort zones and venture forth into the unknown and without a metaphorical map. We mostly like maps. We like to know where we're going and how to get there, what we might encounter or should avoid along the way. The late Anthony de Mello, renowned Indian spiritual teacher and psychotherapist offers this story about maps in his book, The Song of the Bird. The explorer returned to his people who were eager to know about the Amazon, but how could he ever put into words the feelings that flooded his heart when he saw exotic flowers and heard the night sounds of the forests? when he sensed the danger of wild beasts or paddled his canoe over treacherous rapids. He said, go and find out for yourselves. To guide them, he drew a map of the river. They pounced upon the map. They framed it in their town hall. They made copies of it for themselves. And all who had a copy considered themselves experts on the river. Or did they not know its every bend and turn, how broad it was and how deep, where the rapids were and where the falls? It is said that Buddha obdurately refused to be drawn into talking about God. He was probably familiar with the dangers of drawing maps for armchair explorers. Nigerian author and international lecturer, Bayo Okafolafe, wrote a book called, These Wilds Beyond Our Fences, Letters to My Daughter on Humanity's Search for Home. In the words of the publisher, it's a journey of discovery as he maps the contours of the spaces between himself and his three-year-old daughter, Alethea. In it, he's led to consider the strangeness of his own soul contemplate the myths and rituals of modernity, ask questions about food and justice, ponder what it means to be human, and wonder what our collective yearnings for a better world tell us about ourselves. Our reading today is an excerpt from the foreword written by his friend and colleague, Charles Eisenstein. The reading. Dear Althea, I met your father when he was a young man, still searching for a proper channel for his ambition. This, more than our intellectual resonance, is what called us into friendship. You see, our generation faced a quandary. Full of youthful ambition, we had awakened 
to the wrongness of every ready-made goal that society offered as a way to express that ambition. First, we rejected the most obvious conventional goals of money and power, seeking outlet instead in academia, NGOs, science, or any other realm we imagined to be untainted. But as our understanding grew, we realized that every institution was part of the same world-dominating, world-destroying complex. There was nowhere for us to go. With nowhere to go, perhaps we could find our own way. Perhaps we could channel our ambition into revolution or into, quote, building the alternatives, unquote. Yet when we tried that, we discovered the same familiar ways of thinking, scaffolding our dissident organizations and our alternative programs. It wasn't just that society offered us the wrong map. It was the whole formula for making and following a map that was wrong. The very recipe for change-making was part of what needed to change. Smart guys in a room coming up with a brilliant idea, a plan, a blueprint, and then convincing the public and especially the elites to enact a change. What does ambition do when it lacks a destination, an aspiration? It turns toward adventure, a foray into the unknown. It would be inaccurate to say that an adventure has no purpose or a wandering, no outcome. It's just that the purpose is never, in the end, what we thought it was. On the contrary, it is something that was unknowable, residing as it did in the wilds beyond our fences. There are no beginnings that appear unperturbed, pristine, without hauntings. And there are no endings that are devoid of traces of the new, spontaneous departures from disclosure and simmering events that are yet to happen. The middle, the middle isn't the space between things. It is the world in its ongoing practices of worlding itself. We are always in the middle. A will stronger than our own sends us on these journeys. We shall be known by the company we keep By the ones who circle around to tend these five We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change
turning we shall learn to lead in love. This is the time of a great turning. This unexpected, unsolicited, unwanted opportunity for profound change. Let's celebrate the reality that for the past year and a half, we Unitarian Universalists have been energetically and successfully letting go of some norms that we thought were required and irreplaceable and pulling off the unimaginable without anything resembling a map, just learning from each other, using trial and error, encountering our limitations, overcoming them or working around them or accepting them. During what could have been a time of retrenchment and distraction, we've continued to answer the call to widen our circle of concern. Two months ago at UUA General Assembly, we voted overwhelmingly 91% in favor to include a very clear statement in our bylaws affirming that accountable, systemic, anti-racist and anti-oppressive actions to build beloved community are part of what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist. And that's a very clear commitment to continuing this urgently important, but very difficult work. We encounter resistance in the larger American culture we encounter resistance within our congregations. We encounter resistance even within ourselves. But it is time now when so much is still in flux, when we've been pushed beyond some of our traditional boundaries. It is time now that we have the inner strength of our own experience showing us that when we have to, we are able to show up together and do hard things. That map or no map, we won't turn back. Can we admit though that resistance from without or within can be discouraging? Well, I'd like to offer you a lens through which we might observe this adventure we're on. You might be familiar with Parker Palmer, the American author, educator, and activist for spiritual and social change. Palmer has observed patterns in the ways that movements for change unfold, and he has something important to say about resistance. That resistance is not a checkmate. In fact, Parker says resistance is the place where things begin. A movement's evolution unfolds in four sequential steps, which Parker describes as follows. See if any of these patterns resonate with your experience. Step one is when an individual begins to feel like a cognitive dissonance between their own values or experience and the culture of their movement or organization. They might increasingly feel a lack of integrity in being part of that culture but they believe they're alone in these feelings, so they don't say anything. It feels unsafe to speak their truth. Step two is when the individual feels so uncomfortable, they finally do speak up and find they're not alone after all. Indeed, there have been others all along who share the discomfort with the supposedly cherished status quo. It's a little like the French and La Bies. Once some of these emerging dissidents discover each other, they begin to share mutual support and encouragement. Eventually, they move on to step, step three. Empowered by this new awareness of a supportive dissident community within the larger one, the newly minted activists go public with their convictions. They share their concerns within the wider communal discourse where they can be heard and responded to where they can educate, be questioned and challenged, where they can raise awareness, where they can have influence. And so the evolving movement arrives at the fourth step, 
alternative rewards emerge to sustain the new vision. The activists start to feel empowered by that vision as it becomes established. They find ways to create new exciting opportunities to build a community that truly reflects their deepest values. And resistance is an inherent part of the evolution of a movement for change every step of the way. Parker reminds us that at any given time, individuals will find themselves at different stages of the emerging movement. Some are continuing to take comfort in the old ways and are trying to avoid dissension and division. Some are finally beginning to acknowledge even to themselves their own discomfort with the status quo. Some are just discovering they have allies. Some are actively going public to raise a larger awareness and inviting discussion or even debate. And some are creating ways for diverse individuals to participate in the joys and satisfactions offered by an emerging transformative and liberatory movement. And that fourth step, by the way, that is not the end. The goal is that this new movement circles back to intersect with the culture or the institution from which, from which it emerged. Because movements have to keep moving. A movement that stops out of complacency, self-satisfaction, or in response to resistance will die. Maybe you recognized in Parker Palmer's observations what is happening within Unitarian Universalism as we explore, sometimes painfully, sometimes joyfully, these wilds beyond our fences. There may not be maps to guide us as this territory remains as yet unexplored, but there are patterns that provide context and maybe we can find some encouragement there. I also want to share the words of George Erasmus, a, a respected Aboriginal leader in Canada. Now listen, because this is really powerful. Where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. Once again, where common memory is lacking, there can be no real community. Where community is to be formed, common memory must be created. And how do we create common memory to form our beloved community? Unitarian Universalists don't share a common narrative. Institutionally, we reflect the predominant culture that birthed us. And that narrative is steeped in white supremacy culture, colonialism, patriarchy, exceptionalism, but that's not the whole story. If we hope to create an inclusive common memory, if we're committed to widening our circle of concern, then those whose narrative has long been considered foundational, the norm, have a very uncomfortable and difficult task in front of them, in front of us as I recognize myself among them. We will have to summon the courage to finally explore the stories of those whom we've allowed or forced to be invisible, unheard, the exception. And then to integrate those stories as an equally part of a shared past, the common memory of a transformed beloved community. It is new unexplored territory, and so there are no maps to follow. Vulnerability, trust, courage, and faith are required. We may not have a complete vision of a larger, radically inclusive, life-affirming, paradigm-shattering, beloved community of common memory, but we already know what will, what must, lie at its heart. There must be freedom. There must be justice. There must be compassion. And I'm pretty sure there must be singing. 
Will you join me? knowing how quickly the flame of truth may be extinguished, how easily the chalice of kinship broken. Let us be vigilant in faith, keep peace in our hearts, and make care for one another the watchword of our lives together. So our light goes out everywhere into the world. May peace be with you. toughest time you ever knew the only thing that you could do is carry the flame sickness spreading through the land you held your spirit in your hands and carried the flame When storms and sorrows gathered round You raised your head and you stayed your ground You carried the flame Through endless days of the hardest living You kept on loving, kept on giving You kept on and carried the flame the flame, raise it high, send its beacon through the sky, keep it strong and shining through the pain. Let it rise and let it grow, let it light the world you know, let it glow, carry the flame. And when the day is done at last, we take on the spark you passed. And 
carry the flame From hand to hand we send it on The kindling hope of a rising dawn In us all we carry the flame Carry the flame Raise it high, send its beacon through the sky, keep it strong and shining through the pain. Let it rise and let it grow, let it light the world you know, let it glow. Carry the flame. We are nurses, doctors, teachers We are children, parents, preachers And we all carry the flame We are scientists and cargo packers Farmers, singers, grocery stackers Young and old, we carry the flame the flame, raise it high, send its beacon through the sky, keep it strong and shining through the pain. Let it rise and let it grow, let it light the world you know, let it glow. Carry the flame. Let it glow, carry the flame.